Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Michelle Zapeta and I'm the program coordinator at Waterford Place Cancer Resource Center. Waterford Place provides programs and services free of charge for anyone impacted by a cancer diagnosis that supports whole person care. I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Chochi from Rush University Medical Center. Dr. Chochi is a cardiologist and an associate professor of medicine at Rush University Medical Center. As the Director of Cardio-Oncology at Rush, she has spearheaded a number of successful cardio-oncology initiatives. Her clinical and research interests are in the fields of cardio-oncology, where she is well-published and is currently championing research projects that involve identification of risk for and prevention of chemotherapy and radiation-induced cardiomyopathy. Uh, welcome, Dr. Tochi, and I will turn it over to you now. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Teresa, and thank you for all the people that organized this. Um, Cardio-oncology is my specialty, which basically is heart disease in cancer patients. And this is something that I do um, love to uh, discuss and talk about. So I do hope you all will find this uh, uh, session very uh, informative. Please, I want to make this as interactive as possible. So please feel free to stop me in between if you have any questions. I don't mind. I am going to try to um, give uh, pauses in between, as, as she said, um, just to hear if anybody has any questions to make sure that everybody understands what we're discussing. So um, let's see. It's not letting me move the slides. OK. Um, OK. So um, in the United States, uh, we have um, deaths uh, due to cancer and heart disease, right? The heart disease is the number one cause of death in the U.S. currently, while cancer is a very close second cause of death in the U.S. Um, you know, if we go back and we look at um, going back to the 1950s, heart disease was the number one infectious disease, of course, prior to that. Um, and heart disease has steadily gone up and maybe just being recognized more. But because of all the progress that we've made with respect to heart disease, that risk of death, according to heart disease, is actually reducing and coming down. While that of cancer is going up because we are diagnosing more cancers these days, um, it is postulated and, and projected that by about 2030, that cancer would be number one cause of death in the US and heart disease would be a number two um, cause of death. Um, and so if we look at the lifetime odds of dying of different causes, again, heart disease and cancer are, are, are uh, uh, number one and two causes of death. If you add stroke, stroke is considered a cardiovascular disease. So if you add stroke to heart disease, then that beats cancer as number one. But again, it is postulated that by 2030, cancer will take over as a number one cause of death in the U.S. And when we look at the number of um, U.S. cancer survivors by site, and we, we're basically looking at the number of cancer survivors. We obviously, uh, the number one and two causes of, I'm sorry, the number one uh, cause of cancer in men is prostate cancer and in women is breast cancer. When we look at the number of cancer survivors, um, we can see that um, that number totals somewhere around 15, 16 million in the United States. That was in, in 2016. That's the latest data that we have. But fast forward to 2026, and it's postulated that that number is going to increase to about 21 million uh, cancer survivors in the United States. And so that's a reasonable number. And a lot of, you know, cancer survivors, the number is growing, and that's a great thing. And the reason why the number of cancer survivors is growing is because we are, we've made a lot of progress when it comes to treatment for cancer. Um, and so now we have, in addition to chemotherapy and radiation therapy, now we have things like immunotherapy. And so patients, uh, because of immunotherapy, are living longer. You know, cancers that could never, that we never had cures for in the past, such as melanoma, we now have actually some melanomas that are being cured now um, with immunotherapy. So that's a great thing. The problem though, is that a lot of these patients, because of the treatments that they receive for their cancer have potential long-term um, cardiovascular disease, which can then mess up or, or, or uh, interfere with the successes that we've already had with the treatment of their cancer. And that's the reason why we have to pay attention to the heart in this situation. And when we look at cancer survivors in different states, so you, you know, not surprising, California has the biggest number of cancer survivors just by the sheer size and population of the state, uh, uh, followed by Texas, Pennsylvania, New York City, of, of course, is a, is a big one. 
Um, and Illinois actually is number five. Um, that's uh, good to know because this is where we are. And so we have to do our best to manage our cancer survivors. Um, and also if you take the Midwest, um, Illinois and Ohio are uh, two big ones that have a good number of uh, cancer survivors, also Michigan as well. So what are the facts about heart disease in cancer? More than 50%, so more than half of all patients that have been exposed to chemotherapy will have some sort of heart disease associated with it. About 5% will develop heart failure, 40% will have heart rhythm problems, and there's an eight-fold higher risk of death from heart disease and its related causes compared with the general population. And so that's a very important thing to think about and to remember. And this slide um, is looking at what we call reduced cardiac reserve. In other words, um, heart disease is kind of getting worse going down this way, and we're looking at age going across this way. And we can see that um, for a healthy person, it's not surprising that as people age, their risk of having heart disease and their heart being less able to take problems um, goes up. Um, so those people that are, even those that are healthy have problems as they age. Those that have heart disease risk factors have more problems. So you can see that they decline faster than the healthy ones. But the cancer survivors actually worse than people that um, we, that have cardiac risk factors. And so again, this is a population that we definitely need to pay attention to. And when we look at um, uh, uh, childhood cancer survivors or people that had cancer when they were kids and now there's cancer survivors um, at this time, this is what we would expect, right? We would expect that this is the amount of heart disease that, um, or, uh, death from heart disease that they would accumulate as they, as they get older is this amount. But look at for, for what we actually see in patients who received cancer treatment, this is actually what we see. And you can see a steep increase um, in the risk of death associated with, uh, with, uh, with cardiovascular disease and cardiac diseases as these people age. And when we look at organ systems, um, so new malignancy, so new cancers um, amongst, amongst cancer survivors in the red line and their siblings in the gold uh, colored line, the, the um, new malignancy is higher amongst cancer survivors. And that's not surprising. This is because these patients receive chemotherapy, they receive radiation therapy. Um, and so this chemo and radiation actually predispose them to um, having um, new cancers as they get older. And then when we look at other organ systems, we look at hearing, um, kidney problems, respiratory problems, visual problems. Those are all more in patients who have received uh, cancer treatment, but look at heart. The heart disease is basically almost as much as the people who have, um, sorry, the risk of heart disease amongst cancer survivors is almost as high as the risk of new cancers amongst the cancer survivors. And so again, we need to pay attention to the heart because that seems to be the worst thing next to new cancer. That seems to be the worst thing that these cancer survivors um, have problems with. So if we look at the leading sites of new cancer cases and deaths, so this is 2018 estimates. Um, we see that uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer for men, breast cancer for women, and for bre both breast and prostate cancer, um, sorry, for both men and women, the lung cancer seems to be um, the main thing that affects both uh, population. So these are the three main cancers that a lot of people have problems with in the United States and that cause the death associated with um, cancer and cancer uh, treatment in the United States. So looking at interactions between the heart and risk factors, <clears throat> as well as cancer and cancer therapy, we can see that the heart disease and cancer share common risk factors, smoking, obesity, um, and uh, in a diet that is not optimal for heart and cancer, and then physical inactivity, right? Um, all of these will increase the risk of cancer. All of these will also the risk increase the risk of heart disease. When they increase the risk of cancer, the person ends up getting treatment, right? They get surgery, they get chemo, they get uh, immunotherapy or targeted therapies, they get radiation. <clears throat> well, when they have heart disease, they end up having problems with their heart to begin with. Well, if they have this bed of problems already with their heart and they get all these treatment, that already affects a heart that's already vulnerable to begin with. And these treatments in turn also increase the risk of further cancers which then interacts amongst cancer survivors, interacts with their already established heart disease and put together all of these just increase the risk of having more heart problems as cancer survivors age. So when we think about chemotherapies, for example, we think about chemotherapy induced heart disease. There are a few things that we think about that can happen. 
heart failure or what we call cardiomyopathy. And you can see that there's a whole lot of agents, cancer agents that can cause this. Uh, the prototypical ones that we think about are the anthracyclines, and that includes drugs like doxorubicin, which is also known as adriamycin, that it's used for uh, lymphoma, <clears throat> breast cancers, and so on. Hypertension, and when I say hypertension, I don't mean just the regular blood pressures of 140s or 130s. I mean hypertension with blood pressures of 180s and 200s and 220. So that's scary because those are the kinds of blood pressures that can actually make somebody have a stroke. Um, heart rhythm problems, and that could be heart rhythm problems with very low heart rhythm that may end up requiring pacemakers or very fast heart rhythm that can end up requiring further treatment like ablation therapy and the rest of them. Ischemia, which includes things like heart attacks or strokes um, and the rest of them that these people can also be, uh, pretty, that cancer survivors can also be predisposed to. And we start with the, the prototypical drug that causes heart failure, and that's doxorubicin, also known as adriamycin. Like I said, this is used for different kinds of cancers, <clears throat> which are pretty common, including leukemias, lymphomas, breast cancer, sarcomas, and so on. Um, Doxorubicin or adriamycin actually inserts itself into the heart cells, and the heart cells don't have a way for protecting themselves. The heart cells are pretty poor at protecting themselves. And so it, it causes damage to the heart cell, and which actually may take years, years, into up to 20 years before it can manifest itself. So this is um, a concerning thing about this particular drug. And you can see here the heart muscle that is organized, what we call striated. So it's linear or in an organized fashion. This is a normal heart cell. When it's predisposed to doxorubicin, this is a sort of disorganization that you can see. This is called fibrosis or scar tissue that's formed within, in between those cells. And this is the reason why these patients end up developing um, heart failure. <clears throat> This is a normal heart and it's usually uh, uh, what we call um, uh, an uh, ellipt elliptical shape for a normal heart. And you can see how this has changed and becomes disorganized as a result of this drug called doxorubicin. And regarding doxorubicin, we can have problems within the first week of treatment. That's what we call an acute uh, problem that you can have within the first week of treatment. The more common scenario is usually within the first year. That's where we see most of the uh, toxicities associated with this drug. Um, and then, but this, tox this toxicity can last as much as 20 years, like I said earlier. And you can, you can get people that fall into this category. So these people that receive doxorubicin, especially when they receive a high dose of the drug, these people need to be monitored um, as um, uh, uh, more often than usual. And these are risk factors for developing heart disease associated with doxorubicin. The dose is relevant, right? So it says here greater than 500 milligrams per meter squared, but we do start to get concerned once patients receive about 250 to 300 milligrams per meter squared of doxorubicin, and it's a cumulative dose. So it's a dose that, you know, say for example, a patient has, um, you know, uh, leukemia or lymphoma when they were say 1990 or so. Now fast forward to 2000, 2020, you're gonna start counting from whatever dose they received in 1990. You're gonna add that dose in 1990 to the dose that they're gonna be receiving in 2000, maybe because some, some other cancer came up that needs this drug. So it's a cumulative lifetime dose. That's what we're concerned about. The length of treatment is important. How quickly we administer the treatment is important. The type of anthocycline. So again, doxorubicin is the one we worry about the most. We also worry they received radiation as well because that contributes to the risk. Um, or other treatments that can cause heart failure, such as trastuzumab, also known as Herceptin, that's used to treat breast cancer and, a, and a, um, a few other drugs. If they have heart disease risk factors like hypertension, uh, heart artery blockage or ischemia, um, or, or heart valve problems, that increases that risk. Or if they have baseline heart failure, that increases the risk as well. Um, their age, so people who are older, age greater than 65, or people who are younger, like teenagers or kids, uh, little kids, um, those people are at more predisposed risk to having a problem with this particular drug. Women have more problems than men. Um, and you can see here, the, um, the clear circles represent women, um, the pink uh, dark circles, uh, dark pink circles represent um, men. And you can see that as time goes on, the risk of having heart failure is high with the, this particular drug, doxorubicin or adriamycin, is higher in women compared to men. 
So then ways for preventing uh, problems associated with anthracyclines or doxorubicin type medications, we can use uh, things like cold iron binders, um, uh, uh, like dextrazoxane, which we tend to use in people who get uh, frequent transfusions or people who have um, uh, a particular type of iron overload syndrome. Um, we, could, we could limit the, um, the dose that these patients, that patients receive we could slow the infusion of the drug so we could make sure that it's not given fast, like it's given over a few days rather than given just over a day. Um, we can use other drugs that are like adriamycin, but are not as toxic, right? So other types of anthracyclines that we can use, like epirubicin is one or midoxantrone. We can use what we call liposomal anthracyclines, which are other types of anthracyclines as well. We can start them on hard drugs called ACE inhibitors or beta blockers. And the recovery is time dependent, right? So this particular um, graph or image shows that if we start treatment with, um, if we start treatment for heart failure associated with doxorubicin early, usually within the first one to two months, we get up to two thirds of patients responding to that treatment. So if we discover that there's a problem early and we treat early, then we have a bigger chance of recovering heart function. But as time goes on, if we don't discover that they have a the patient has a problem and time moves on from when they first developed um, uh, the heart failure associated with this drug and we don't do anything, chances of recovery within six to eight months goes down to 0%. So this is a very important point to make that it's, it's better to make the diagnosis early. So we have to be vigilant about watching patients that have received, especially higher doses of this drug. So another treatment, and, and I want to stop here and ask, does anybody have any questions about what I've discussed so far or any comments or something that you would like to discuss? And you can either type them or feel free to unmute yourself and just ask your question. No one for now? Okay, I'll continue. Again, please feel free to stop me, okay? All right, so um, trastuzumab or Herceptin, um, like I mentioned earlier, is one of the drugs that can be used to treat uh, breast cancer and a, and a, a few other cancers as well. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be toxic, like uh, adriamycin or doxorubicin, and it adds to the risk of toxicity associated with adriamycin or doxorubicin because we know this because it's given or administered usually um, sometimes after doxorubicin has been given in breast cancer patients, or sometimes before. So that's important. And it's usually given for a whole year. So we do need to monitor patients that receive this drug for that period of time. Again, it can be used for breast cancer. It's also used for um, stomach cancer as well. So we can get heart failure associated with, uh, with trastuzumab. The other name for it, again, is Herceptin. Um, and more often, um, it causes uh, decreased heart function, but doesn't really lead to clinic, what we call clinical heart failure. In other words, people presenting with shortness of breath and chest pain, and sorry, shortness of breath and leg swelling and the rest of them is not as common with this drug compared to doxorubicin, but they do get a weak heart from it. It's not related to the dose of the drug, unlike the doxorubicin, and it's usually reversible once we stop treatment for the most part. And even if we stop treatment, we can do what we call a re-challenge. In other words, we can stop treatment, give the patients about a month or two to recover, and then re-administer this particular drug um, to see. Um, and most of the time, patients tend to do well. When you, re when you hold it for a little period of time and re-administer it, the patients tend to do well. The problem is when it's not noticed that it's a problem and somebody is trying to give this drug, then that could be um, a problem for these patients. And the, because, and the reason why we can re-challenge is that the heart cells are not usually destroyed, unlike if they receive anthracyclines or doxorubicin type of medications. And so again, this is what the heart would look like under normal circumstances, and you give the anthracyclines or doxorubicin or adriamycin type of medications, and they start to look sort of uh, round. And if you add trastuzumab to it, you increase that risk. And this particular slide shows that Patients who receive anthracycline and trastuzumab are at higher risk over time 
of developing heart failure, right? Um, if they receive anthracyclines by themselves or they receive trastuzumab by themselves, that risk is not as high. And the risk factors are similar, right? If they have baseline heart problems to begin with, or uncontrolled high blood pressure, valve, heart valve problems, heart rhythm problems, other heart disease risk factors, if they received chest wall radiation, especially to the left side, which, you know, if people have left-sided breast cancer, that can be something that can happen, or they have lymphoma or later develop lung cancer. So these are all things that we need to think about and think about the treatments that patients have received prior and the treatments that they're going through right now and kind of try to think about how best to, um, to assess their risk of heart disease moving forward, especially if they're getting current treatments that can hurt, that can harm the heart. And this slide shows again that you can give trastuzumab or Herceptin um, if they develop a weak heart after you give it to them, you can give them time to kind of rest and not give them treatment for a, a, a month or two and then re-challenge the drug. And usually most of those patients, their heart function does not get that much worse. So you can see that it doesn't quite fall to what it or how bad it had been before. So that's usually how we manage people on this drug. I think the problem is when they develop heart failure with this drug and nobody notices, and they keep getting this drug and getting this drug and getting this drug, then that's a concern because by the time you're done giving it, usually again, it's given for a whole year. And if they have metastatic breast cancer, sometimes they can be given indefinitely as long as they're responding from a cancer standpoint. And so somebody would need to keep an eye on these on, on this such uh, patient's uh, uh, heart function because of this particular risk so that we can discover early if there's a problem. So another class of drugs that I use pretty commonly for very many different types of cancers, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. We use this to treat, like I said, many different kinds of cancers. Um, we use it for leukemia, for stomach cancer, for kidney, livers, um, pancreatic, different kinds of cancers. And they're different types. These class of drugs, there are many of them in the market. The prototypical one was imatinib or Vivec, which was discovered in the early 2000s and actually changed the way we think about cancer. This is all where the concept of immunotherapies and targeted therapies for treatment of cancer came from, from this particular drug called Clevec. And again, there are many different drugs in this particular class. And we usually use them, um, we, uh, one of the drugs that we particularly, that I can think about from this particular class is bevacizumab or avastin. And that's usually used for gynecologic uh, malignancies or gynecologic cancers like endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, sometimes in metastatic breast cancer and also different other, other types of cancer that it can be used for. And these particular class of drugs, they're called uh, VEGF uh, signaling pathway inhibitors. They, because of the way they act and because of the way they, they actually help um, uh, reduce the risk of, uh, or sorry, the way they actually treat the cancer, they end up causing side effects as a result. And that includes hypertension or high blood pressure, cardiomyopathy or things like heart failure, um, arterial thrombosis, which can lead to um, things like heart attacks or strokes. So basically arterial thrombosis means forming a clot in an artery or what we call a QT prolongation, which basically um, refers to an abnormal EKG that can lead to heart rhythm problems eventually or heart or uh, a cardiac arrest. So, but the interesting thing about this particular drug is that hypertension with this drug is a marker of response to treatment. So that means that if we want patients to develop hypertension on these drugs, because the hypertension that comes with these drugs means that they're responding, and that's a good thing. But the thing is that that high blood pressure needs to be treated. And so you can see that um, the blue line refers to people who have developed hypertension with the drug. The, um, the green represents people that did not develop hypertension with the drug. And those that develop hypertension with the drug, as you can see, actually live longer and do better compared to those that do not develop hypertension with the drug. So that's, that's good that they do. The thing is, though, that we have to treat it because there have been other studies that have shown that if the patients are not treated, um, their, if, sorry, their blood pressures are not treated, these patients do worse. So it's important that their blood pressures get monitored and get treated. The, these, are the, these are the kind of drugs that can actually cause blood pressures that are as high as 200, 220. I've seen patients with blood pressure as high as 240 with this drug, and they end up in the emergency room. They could develop a stroke and things like that. And treatments ends up, their, their cancer treatment ends up being discontinued, and that's not a good thing for the cancer either. So we need to, in these patients, monitor their blood pressures closely. 
and make, her, make sure that we're managing their blood pressures. I do tend to ask my clinic patients to keep a blood pressure log and we uh, we monitor the blood pressure logs pretty frequently and make adjustments to the monitor to the blood pressure medications as much as we need to, only for the first few weeks. And then after the first few weeks, we have a good sense of what their blood pressures are. We have a good sense of what their medications are and we've managed them appropriately. And then usually they can monitor themselves less frequently after that because then we've controlled their blood pressures. And um, there's certain particular medications that are better at controlling blood pressures with these particular drugs compared to others. So what about radiation therapy, right? Now I'm kind of, I've talked about the most common types of chemos. Um, there are a whole bunch of other chemos that cause all the types of heart problems um, anyway, but radiation therapy can cause um, various types of heart problems, right? So atherosclerosis or blockage of the heart artery, it can cause a heart block, which ends up requiring a pacemaker. They can cause a tight valve, heart valve, or a leaky heart valve, which ends up requiring heart surgery. They can cause inflammation of fluid to build up around the heart. Um, and that usually um, ends up being treated with either drainage or surgery. And they can cause racing or heart palpitations, racing heart or heart palpitations, which these risks with radiation actually worsen with time. They get worse with time. So as time goes on, these risks increase with radiation. So people that have received radiation in the 1990s and 2000s and 1980s, these are people that we're now seeing in our clinic as cancer survivors that have developed problems as a result of radiation therapy. And so this is a heart artery um, that's clean, nothing going on. And then that heart artery receives radiation therapy and through a whole process of different sorts of um, substances that get generated as a result of inflammation from the radiation, you get um, a cholesterol plaques and fibrosis that build up within the, the heart artery. And this is usually what ends up causing blockage of the heart artery. And the heart artery blockage that comes with radiation therapy is pretty distinctive. It's a certain type of um, um, heart artery blockage that affects certain heart arteries, usually what we call the LAD and the RCA. And it's a pinpoint type of heart artery blockage and all the other parts of the artery are completely normal, nothing else going on. And we usually know in that situation that that's radiation that's caused it. And so when we think about radiation-induced heart disease, it's dependent on the dose of radiation that the patients have received. We see it more with left-sided radiation. So again, people that have left-sided breast cancer, if they had lymphoma or lung cancer or esophageal cancer, it's all over the chest. So that includes the left side and the right. So that's, um, it's less common with right-sided breast cancer patients because they focused on just that right side. If they have heart disease or heart disease risk factors, that risk is more. And if they've received chemotherapy in the past, especially adriamycin, we do get concerned about that. And it can happen up to 20 years or more after radiation treatment. It's, it's basically a lifetime risk. That's the way we think about it. And so dose-dependent radiation um, damage to the heart, this is what it looks like. So this is a normal um, heart se uh, set of heart cells at low-dose radiation. Normal cells are usually well-organized. If they receive low-dose radiation, you already have some level of damage, although it's not a whole lot. But look at somebody who has received a lot of radiation. You can see how um, distorted the architecture is. It's, it's kind of all uh, messed up. So that's concerning. And patients who received radiation, um, again, they develop all sorts of heart problems. I want you guys to note that one of the things that we worry about is something called cardiac autonomic dysfunction. This is probably one of the more common and one of the least recognized side effects of radiation. Uh, people that receive mantle or chest radiation, another group of people are people that have head and neck cancer that receive radiation therapy to their necks. Um, um, these people, because we have nerves that run in that area, so you can see here, um, these are um, schematic uh, representation of nerves that run in that area. And these nerves also run within the heart muscle itself. So if you get radiation to the neck area, to the heart, which is in the chest area, um, those people are at risk for having this autonomic dysfunction. And that affects the heart rates. They can get uh, racing hearts um, or problems with blood pressures that run too high, run too low, all over the place. And this is what we refer to as autonomic dysfunction, which can be pretty disabling in some of the patients that we see in our clinic. So here's a case um, of a patient. In 1984, the patient had Hodgkin's disease with radiation to the chest and to the neck area. 2005, the patient ended up receiving a permanent pacemaker for complete heart block that resulted as a result of the radiation that they received. And in 2007, so two years later, so again, please note um, in this particular uh, case, 
1984 was it was the initial treatment 2005 so 21 years later 21 years later the patient ends up needing a pacemaker for treatment that they received um, earlier and then uh, pericardial effusion which is fluid around the heart uh, later on and the patient ends up requiring a procedure for that and eventually they do develop a heart artery blockages so these are all resulting many 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 years later now that doesn't mean that we don't see people who receive radiation who have problems with their heart within the first few years. We do see them. And in fact, they've been reported. There's actually a really nice study um, that uh, looked at this a few uh, about three or four, five years back. And they actually found that within the first five years, some people can still develop a problem, but more of the risk is with time. So as time goes on 20 years, 25 years, we tend to see this more. With, that's with radiation therapy. And how about endocrine therapy for breast cancer? So people that have breast cancer that receive um, endocrine therapy with tamoxifen or what we call the, the SERMs uh, type of medications or the aromatase inhibitors like letrozole and astrozole or eczemestane, these people can have some sort of heart issues. Um, the aromatase inhibitors are associated with increased risk of heart attacks and strokes while the, um, the uh, uh, tamoxifen type of medications can increase, have increased risk of blood clots in the veins. Um, interestingly, tamoxifen lowers uh, bad cholesterol. So that's good in that sense, but the, there's again, increased risk of blood clots in the veins. And then we have um, uh, other medications, other chemotherapies like cisplatin used to treat different kinds of cancers. Notable are things like uh, uh, lung cancers. It's used to treat lung cancers and it's also used to treat some of the GI malignancies like colorectal cancer and the rest of them. It can be detected in the blood up to 20 years after treatment. Um, and so it, we, what we call, it, it causes what we call a delayed cardiovascular toxicity that includes heart attacks and strokes. Um, in these patients because it makes their blood vessels really stiff. Six-fold, so six times higher risk of coronary artery disease or heart artery blockage, and three-fold higher risk of heart attacks. Um, and this is with time later on down the line with cisplatin. Hypertension can also result as, uh, uh, as a result of people receiving cisplatin and abnormal cholesterol profiles and insulin resistance and diabetes and so on and so forth. So risk factors for heart disease in cancer survivors compared to their siblings. So cancer, so siblings are in the gold, cancer survivors themselves are in the blue line. And hypertension, as you can see, is higher amongst the survivors compared to their siblings. And risk of dyslipidemia or high cholesterol is higher amongst the survivors compared to their siblings. The same thing with diabetes, higher amongst the survivors compared to their siblings. And interestingly, the survivors are not obese. The survivors actually have lower weights compared to their siblings. So despite the fact that they're not obese, the survivors tend to have more of these heart cardiac risk factors. And so we know that a lot of these uh, risk factors that they have is as a result of the treatments that they received. Hypertension is a particularly major issue in this population. Hypertension is by far the highest cardiac risk factor that they develop, as you can see, but also hypertension carries the highest risk of death due to heart disease after cancer treatment. And so monitoring and treating blood pressure is one of the most important things that we can do for cancer patients and their survivors from a cardiac standpoint. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the most important things that we can do. And in this graph, we're looking at people that have coronary artery disease. If they have heart disease risk factors, um, they have about six times higher risk of coronary disease. If they have received chest radiation, they have about four times higher risk of coronary disease. Well, if they have heart disease risk factors and they have received chest radiation, then they have up to a 32 times higher risk of heart disease. The same thing with heart failure, that risk increases to about 19 times higher risk if they've received uh, chest radiation and they have heart disease risk factors. So people, patients who have heart disease risk factors particularly should be monitored closely and their heart disease risk factors put under control. So things like diet, weight loss, exercise, not smoking, making sure the cholesterol is where it needs to be, no diabetes, all that stuff, blood pressure control, that's particularly important in a cancer survivor that has received treatment um, compared to the general population. And uh, we can see here that the risk of heart failure worsens with time um, uh, uh, as, people, as um, in breast cancer survivors, and that is dependent on the treatments that they've received. 
I cannot finish this talk without talking about immune checkpoint inhibitors. That is the wave of the future. This is part of the reason why cancer patients are living longer, if not the main reason. So we kind of have to talk about them a little bit. What are immune checkpoint inhibitors? Immune checkpoint inhibitors are um, agents, so cancer agents, that at, they don't attack the cancer cells directly, but they basically allow our immune system to attack the cancer cell. And so here, for example, you see this is a cancer cell. This is what we call a T cell, which is our own cells that are responsible for attacking foreign bodies, anything that is not part of our system. These T cells and other um, immune cells are responsible for attacking them and killing them. The killer T cells are responsible for killing a lot of these other cells. But the cancer cell is so smart that what it does is that it, it creates receptors. It has developed receptors that attach to these T cells and basically incapacitate them, incapacitate these T cells. So the T cells can't attack the cancer cells because they're incapacitated by the cancer cell. And that allows the cancer cell to go on and continue to grow and continue to destroy our bodies, right? And what the immune checkpoint inhibitors do, and these scientists that developed this are just so smart, what they do is that they competitively attach to the T cell and free it up. By doing this, they, sorry, they competitively attach to the T cell and free it up. And some of them attach to the cancer cells receptors that attach to the T cells and free it up, then allowing the T cell to attach to, sorry, to attack the cancer cell itself, and then start to kill the cancer cell. So they basically free up the T cell to attack the cancer cell. And so our own immune system is then what attacks the cancer cell. It's free to do what it's supposed to do. Um, the problem is when our immune system does, and this is good, this is effective, this can actually cure the cancer cell in certain circumstances, or at least keep it at bay for years and years. So that's a good thing. Patients live longer because of this. The problem, though, is that this T cell that's then freed up can also start to attack our own cells because it just goes crazy sometimes and starts to attack our own cells. So it can cause different problems from inflammation of the eyes to inflammation of the thyroid to inflammation of the lungs called the pneumonitis. Um, it can cause a hepatitis, which is inflammation of the liver and nephritis or inflammation of the kidney, a colitis or inflammation of the bowels, all sorts of things. And then it can also cause what we call a myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart. I mentioned this, of course, because I'm a cardiologist, but also the reason I mentioned this is because a myocarditis can actually kill up to 50% of patients that develop a myocarditis on these immune checkpoint inhibitors will die as a result. And so early recognition and early treatment is very important. We typically treat them with high dose steroids, or we could use other, um, other agents that fight the immune system to treat these to treat um, these particular things when they occur, especially the myocarditis. It's, again, I have to mention, it's not very common to have a myocarditis as a result of immune checkpoint inhibitors. But again, they do develop because of the 50% risk of death or one in two risk of death. We have to, mon we have to um, catch it early and to treat and manage it early. And so um, when we think about cancer and heart disease, we have patients who have heart disease risk factors at baseline are at higher risk. Um, if they have a cancer diagnosis, that adds to the risk. Um, if they receive treatment with uh, chemo and or radiation therapy, that even adds even more to that and increases that risk. And that then increases the risk of heart disease, risk uh, strokes and heart attack associated with uh, cancer treatment. But we can manage all of these by modifying our risks, right? Again, diet, exercise, reducing stress, not smoking, doing all the right things that we're supposed to do to keep ourselves healthy. So um, regaining and improving health through healthy behaviors, physical activity, very important. It has been shown um, to improve survival in cancer patients. Um, and, um, and, and we, in fact, we studied this, um, my group and I, um, I studied this with my group, um, in WHI Women's Health Initiative study. And we found that patients who exercise at baseline, even before they have a cancer diagnosis, and even before they receive cancer treatment, have less risk of heart attacks, strokes, and heart disease in general, after they've, they've, they've been diagnosed with cancer and received uh, cancer treatment. Um, so that's really important. Exercise can also improve fatigue, make people less tired, even while they're going through treatment, reduce anxiety associated with cancer therapy, 
um, and treatment um, and cancer. Um, increased self-esteem, increased happiness, and overall increased quality of life for both cancer patients and cancer survivors. Um, smoking cessation, it goes without saying that that's a major problem that we need to face and treat as best as we can, um, because smoking also increases risk of recurrence of the cancer and risk of second cancer. So it's very important that we treat this. Um, so smoking cessation efforts are more successful when they're initiated soon after cancer diagnosis. So that's important. Um, obesity, some, a number of studies have shown that obesity and weight gain um, increases the risk of breast cancer recurrence, so breast cancer coming back, and also reduces survival associated with uh, breast cancer, not just breast cancer, other cancers, other cancers too, like colorectal cancer and the rest of them. And obesity also increases the risk of treatment-related side effects like lymphedema and fatigue. And actually, obesity is a problem if patients are going through surgery. Those people, patients are usually at higher risk for developing complications as a result. And then diet, plenty of fruits, vegetables, whole grains. That's very important for cancer patients and survivors because these are things that are antioxidants and keep our cells healthy. Um, limited amount of fat, red meat, processed meat, simple sugars, um, like the, you know, the processed sugars like white sugar and baked goods and pastries and things like that. So we have to be very careful about them. Reduces the risk of developing second cancers and the risk of chronic diseases. Limit alcohol, alcohol consumption. I have to change this. It says two drinks per day. Two drinks per day is too much. And uh, two drinks per day for, um, for men and one drink per day for women used to be the what our guidelines recommended, but we're finding that that's all too much now. And um, these, uh, I, you know, there was a recent study not too long ago, about a year or so ago, that actually showed that patients who drank more than five to seven drinks per week are at higher risk for developing cancers. So it's really important that we keep our drinks to minimal. I tell my patients, you don't have to have more than one or two glasses of wine per week, right? So we have to be really cautious of things like that. Exercise helps, right? So people that exercise, um, less have higher risk of having a major cardiac event as opposed to that those that exercise less, uh, sorry, those that exercise more. The more exercise in the gold line do better than those that exercise less in the blue line. The risk of co a coronary artery disease event like a heart attack is also less when they exercise more. Risk of heart failure is less when people exercise more. Risk of heart valve replacement issues are less too. Like the overall, people that exercise have better cardiac reserve so that whenever anything happens to affect their health, they tend to tolerate that better. And so their heart tends to do that better overall. So call out your doctor, call your doctor if you have symptoms of heart disease, and that includes chest pains, shortness of breath, leg swelling, dizziness, lightheadedness, or fainting spells, palpitations. So if you have any of these, you need to make sure that you consult your physician and that your physician is aware of it. Um, and it, I say this especially to cancer survivors because I think a lot of cancer survivors end up going out into the community and when they, um, and, you know, they get treated at a tertiary center or a secondary center and then they go out into the community to follow up with their primary care doctors. Um, and sometimes they don't mention it to their doctors that they receive treatment or even if they, they, it's in the notes that they receive treatment, nobody remembers that they receive cancer treatment. And they, when they start to develop symptoms such as these, people think about them just like the regular patient. But that's not the case. Because cancer patients are at higher risk, we need to think about cancer patients as people, as people that we have to have a low threshold for testing to try to figure out what's going on with them. So this is really important that cancer patients overall take charge of their health and are able to remind their doctors, hey, I received this type of treatment. I understand it can cause this type of problem. Now I'm having these issues. Should we get more testing? Should I be referred to somebody? Okay, so that's really very important. So what we, when we talk about the ABCDEs to prevent heart disease in, in um, it says breast cancer survivors, but overall in cancer survivors, we talk about awareness of risk of heart disease, um, whether they should be on aspirin or not, not everybody has to be on aspirin. Some people, but not everyone. Blood pressure control, cholesterol control, cigarettes, mm -hmm. diet and weight management. Um, knowing the dose of the chemotherapy and radiation therapy is very important. Um, preventing and treating diabetes, making sure that the patients exercise, um, and also whether we should get echocardiograms or EKGs or other things to monitor the risk of heart problems. 
And then um, we, when we think about um, the cancer patients, we think about them before treatment. If they have risk factors that we need to be concerned about, then they should be um, evaluated and taken care of before they start treatment. And this is usually a very quick process because we don't want to delay their treatment. If they have problems during treatment, they definitely should be referred. And if they end up developing problems after treatment, those set of people should also be referred and evaluated um, and managed appropriately through time. So that's very important. And with that, I end my talk and I'm very happy to welcome any questions, comments, or discussions. Thank you so much, Dr. Tochi. Um, we already have one question here. So how much exercise should you do per week? So the American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. So a moderate intensity exercise, for example, would be something like brisk walking or biking. So they recommend 150 minutes per week. And I always tell my patients, you can break it down, you can do 30 minutes, five days a week, 50 minutes, minutes, three days a week. Those all add up to 150. If you can do more, that's even better. Um, and you can break it down, you know, for my patients that are going through cancer treatment, I tell them you can break it down. You can, you can do, um, 15 minutes twice a day. If you have to 10 minutes, three times a day, that's fine. If you start to walk and find yourself getting tired of fatigue, just sit and rest, stay hydrated. And then, um, you can continue from where you stop. If you're doing, um, a high intensity exercise, such as running, jogging, um, uh, fast swimming, those uh, tennis, especially double tennis, those kinds of um, high intensity activity, then American Heart Association says at least 70, 75 minutes of that is good enough per week. So those are the way we think about it. And then they also say to add some sort of strengthening exercise and like lifting light weights and the rest of them, because they generally give us uh, better strength. Uh, we have a comment here that says that uh, an individual was in the ER today with high blood pressure and uh, there was not much concern when she was there. How high was the blood pressure? Uh, it looks like they're typing. It was uh, at 1.186. Okay, so 186 is high. I think emergency room is sometimes different the way we think about it because sometimes the emergency room may not do anything if they feel that the person's blood pressures were high as a result of something that was happening. You know, like we, I have patients that maybe their blood pressures are 120s at home and they end up in clinic and their blood pressures are 150s because there's a lot of activity and moving around and checking your blood and, and you know, drawing your blood and things like that in clinic, their blood pressures could be elevated as a result. So I wonder if that's part of the reason why the ER didn't do anything um, for this patient. But if the primary reason the patient was in the emergency room was because of high blood pressure, then something should have been done about it because that means the patient's blood pressures were elevated at home before they decided to come into the emergency room. So something would have should have been done if that's the case. But again, I don't, without knowing more of a scenario of what happened, I couldn't possibly comment on it. Thank you. Um, another question is, if I had ABVD and MOPP treatments, plus radiation for Hodgkin's 30 years ago. What is the best way to diagnose possible heart problems now? Which type of diagnostic tests? So yeah, so, it, and that's a great question. So ABVD contains the drug adriamycin, right? So the A part of the ABVD um, is adriamycin. Um, and that's the doxorubicin that I was talking about earlier. So that, that person that received it, I would think, under normal circumstances, the typical dose now that we give for ABVD, which is still used to treat lymphoma, is about 300 milligrams per meter squared. Now, in the 1980s and 1990s, I couldn't possibly tell you exactly what dose they used. It was not as organized as we are about it now. So I couldn't possibly tell you what dose they used then. Um, but at the very least, an EKG and an echo, at the very least, that would be something that I would recommend that you get um, that you make sure that your physician get, um, uh, checks just to make sure that you're doing okay from a cardiovascular standpoint. Does that answer your question? Uh, we'll give them a moment to respond. <clears throat> Well, she types a response. Uh, I'll go ahead and read the next one. Um, are there any regular screening tests we should have or only if we're having symptoms? Regular screening tests. So that's a great question. 
Um, if you've received radiation, our guidelines recommend that you get an EKG once a year. EKGs are very inexpensive. They're under, like, I think some places will charge 10 or 20 bucks. And insurance is covered EKGs anyway because they're very inexpensive. So at least an EKG once a year um, is important. If you've received radiation, then you should get um, an echo and or stress test at least every three to five years. Um, with the radiation. And then for chemotherapy will depend on, sorry, and when I say radiation, I mean radiation to the chest. That's what I mean, radiation to the chest. This is the way we would we would manage it because we're thinking about the heart. Um, if you've received um, chemotherapy, it what monitoring would depend on the chemo and what our concerns are with that particular chemo. At the very late least, would be to control risk factors like I talked about earlier. The heart disease risk factors need to be controlled. The person needs to live a healthy lifestyle at the very least. But uh, further monitoring as a cancer survivor would depend on the treatment. Um, and in response to the previous question, um, the individual said that, that they have significant family history of heart disease and high blood pressure. So she is concerned. Right. No, and I would be. I think it's appropriate to be concerned. And in that situation, you may request to have to be referred to a cardiologist or to an oncocardiologist, somebody who does what I do, um, to, to um, look at you, help you think through your treatments from a cardiovascular standpoint, and then help you figure out a good strategy or a good plan for monitoring. You know, sometimes patients get referred to me and they want to um, they want to get an initial evaluation and then continue to follow up in the community with a community doctor. And we just see the patients make uh, plans for monitoring and then send them back to their physician. So that's an option, or they can just continue to follow up with us too. So again, like I said, everything has to be dependent on the treatment that, that you received. But in terms of your heart disease risk factors, that should not be taken lightly, it should be monitored. You should, depending on the treatment that you received, you may need an echo, you may need a stress test. You definitely need an EKG, there's no doubt about that. And maybe even something like what we call a coronary calcium. So a coronary calcium is a way to determine if your heart arteries have calcium on them, and that can predict risk of heart attack and stroke much, much better than anything else that we have in medicine. So I think that that would be a good thing to think about with your physician. Are there any other questions? or comments. Okay, well, that will conclude our presentation for this evening. Dr. Tochi, thank you so much for your time, for answering these questions and for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, definitely a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, um, Lisa and, um, and Michelle and uh, Teresa. Thank you, everyone, it was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Toshi. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a great evening. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this presentation uh, we will be emailing out tomorrow to everyone who was present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.